Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Well, this is going to be somewhat of an unusual video in the sense that uh, I'm going to go through a number of verses. And what I'm going to ask is that you really follow along and try to connect the dots. Because I want to show you a very interesting process that we see in Scripture which takes us from point A to point Z. Now, I think that you're going to find this really interesting. I've never done anything quite like this before. It took me a while to get all these verses together and to make a few notes on, on it as I go along. And I've never done this before, but uh, this is going to require me using uh, my specs. Okay, so I know I might, you know, I know I may look a little goofy, but I'd, I'd rather your attention not be on me anyway. I would rather your attention be on the following verses. We're going to start at the, stop, at the top. We're going to start at the top of what I have come to see is a very unique process in, uh, in, which, which, God, in which God works in our lives. To, to bring us to, uh, from, you know, our involvement in studying His Word to uh, the point of life, service, and worship. And I want to say right here at the outset that it, it needs to be uh, taken into consideration that this process is is not a complicated number one it's not a complicated process it's just a matter of connecting the right dots and, and i'm talking about connecting scripture uh, scripture with scripture that's number one number two uh, i think it needs to be pointed out that and and, I, and this is what i hope that you find as we uh, get along through this is what i hope that you discover is that this what I, I call a process is far removed far different than just the simple pick up your bible and read it and do it sort of mentality uh, there's no question in my mind that that is the the mindset of the majority of most christians today they they simply look and, and I see this as, as part of the huge problem that Christians face. They simply look at the Bible as a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. And if they just memorize scripture, if they just learn scripture, if they just read what it says to do and they do it, then God will bless them and everything will be fine. And vice versa. If they don't do that, then, well, they're in trouble. Folks, we're talking about spiritual things here. We're not talking about uh, my boss giving me a job manual uh, or that I, if I follow all the instructions, you know, I've done everything right. I've pointed out in the past that the Bible is a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's not a rule book on, on marriage or how to raise our kids or how to make money or anything else. It is the revelation of the person in the work of Christ. So I hope that by the time this is over with, you're going to see the dynamic that's involved here. Uh, I came to see this uh, many years, many, many years ago, and I've basically lived my life in accordance with it. It's a process that God has laid out. It needs to be pointed out that this is not some 10-step formula or 12-step formula of my own. That will take you from the beginning to the end. So I, I want to emphasize that fact as well. So let's start start at the top. Let's start right at the very beginning. Now, with that, uh, uh, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about studying to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I'm going to put these verses up on the screen, 2 Timothy 2, 15. It all begins with our knowing what God has said. Uh, 
I'm assuming I'm talking to already born again believers in Christ. This is not anything. This has nothing to do with evangelism. This has to do with the believer's life in Christ. So we study to show ourselves uh, ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's where it starts. Now, from there, what I like where I'd like to take you is I'd like you to take you to uh, the subject of Revelation because that's what we're talking about. But I want to divide that into two parts: propositional revelation and illumined revelation. There's two aspects to this. What do I mean by propositional revelation? I'm talking about just mere information. I'm talking about words on a page that a non-believer can know. He can quote it. In, 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 in fact, in many cases, he can actually do it. This is just mere information that is apart from illumined revelation, and that's where it starts. Well, it starts with studying God's word, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But God deals with us in the matter of revelation, and it begins with our coming to know. And our coming to know, okay, this truth that he's revealed, the, the difference there between propositional revelation and illumined revelation is, is that God doesn't guarantee that he will illumine any particular truth or enlighten us to any particular truth just because we we read it or we know it. We come uh, by head knowledge. We come to, to know it or understand it. We can, we can come to understand what he said only through illumined revelation. It's where he, he completely reveals to us that what he has said is true and, and that he will do it. It is opening our eyes, our hearts, our minds to the understanding that uh, to where that we understand it just as God understands it. Uh, there's no mistake there. There's no error there. Whereas with propositional revelation, we can be in error. We cannot understand it as he understands it. So, we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's a verse that almost every Christian is familiar with. Propositional revelation. That's the source. That's where the faith comes from, is hearing the word of God. Now we have, we have scripture telling us that there are those who desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. That's propositional revelation. They're teachers of the law. It's not that they can't read or write. It's not that they're, they're stupid. It's just that they don't understand something as God understands it or as he's revealed it. It hasn't been illumined. That's the only reason why that they would be desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. We have a verse that says, For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. You've heard me talk about this many times, that he lights our candle. That's, in, that's illumination, folks. That's in opening our eyes, our hearts, our minds to understand his truth as as he's given it to us. Why do you not understand my speech, said our Lord, even because ye cannot hear my word? There we're looking at propositional revelation, not illumined revelation. So I hope that, that, that you're starting to see the difference here. When it comes to enlightenment or illumined revelation, uh, we have that, that verse, for thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Paul says, uh, the eyes of your heart, your, of your under, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And we also see enlightenment actually mentioned in Hebrews 6, 4, that refers to everyone who's enlightened to the truth of the gospel. 
And, and then we read to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. Uh, we read about that in Acts 26, chapter 26. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to, to light. To open their eyes. So there's a difference between propositional revelation, just merely reading it and understanding it in a human sort of a sense, an in intellectual sense, a propositional sense. And then there's a lumen revelation, which deals with enlightenment. So we've gone from study to propositional revelation to enlightenment or illumined revelation. Next thing on the list is the gift of faith, or that uh, not only is faith a gift, but it's invested in our lives. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of of God. So faith is a gift and faith is invested in our lives. It's based upon the hearing of God's word where the God then takes and illumines that revelation and invests faith in our lives to trust God, believing God that what he has said is true and that he will do it. That's where we've come to now. And the next thing that follows that then is faith tested. And I want to remind you again, this is not some formula that I've made up. These are facts from Scripture that are connected in such a way that they're, they're actually connected in a progressive sort of sense. There's nothing made up here. Uh, these are just verses from Scripture. So we have faith tested. We have our faith tested, and, and uh, we read that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that, than of gold that perishes, says Peter, though it be tried with fire, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. There's a, a popular consensus. The popular belief is that God tests us. That's not exactly true. What he does is he tests our faith. It is our faith that's being tested. That the trial of your faith, the testing of your faith, might be found on the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So now we've come from studying, studying to show ourselves approved, all the way through propositional revelation, illumined revelation, uh, the uh, gift of faith invested, the imparting of faith, and that faith tested. Okay, now once that faith is tested and God brings a circumstance, a trial, a difficulty, a situation in our lives to test that faith, which he will do. That's the whole purpose of it, to give us opportunity to trust him. Then we're looking at faith's righteousness, the righteousness of God that's based on faith. It is God's righteousness. It's not even our own. Okay? Back to the the uh, the back to the to the what I mentioned earlier about the 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 simplicity or the simple idea that we just pick up the Bible, read it, and do it. That's us. That's not God's righteousness. That's, that's, that's law, that's works, that's human merit. So we're looking at faith's righteousness. Even the righteousness of God, that's not our righteousness, which is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there's no difference. And I've pointed out in the past that we can't separate our faith in Christ with his faithfulness. This is faith's righteousness. You actually see that in the grammar. There's a genitive there, faith's righteousness. It's the righteousness that is a result of faith. Faith exercised, folks, equals God's righteousness, true righteousness. Okay? According to Scripture, the only way that you, you yourself, or you or I, can perform true righteousness is through faith. That's what the scripture say, says. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He was, raid, he was made righteous and he therefore was able to believe God. 
I understand, and, and I pointed out in the, out in the past before, God didn't make him righteous because he believed. Okay, he believed because God had made him righteous. The same is true of us. But when it comes to our studying God's word and Him illumining the truth of, of that word to our lives and granting faith, investing that faith in our lives and then testing that faith on an experiential level, that righteousness comes forth, springs forth from our lives as we walk by faith, not by sight. It, come, it springs forth from our lives through the reality of faith, through trusting in God ongoing, continual trusting in God. We also see that in Galatians 3 and James 2. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and, and going about to establish their own righteousness, they haven't submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Okay? So we're looking at the faith being tested and then the righteousness of God, which is based on faith. We come a long way from studying to that point. But here's where it really gets interesting. We've been given all a measure of faith. Now, common sense will tell you folks that we don't have all faith. No one does, no one ever has, no one ever will. Now that's a problem, okay? The reason that's a problem is, is, is in the next step, which is whatsoever is not of, of faith is sin, but I'm not quite there yet. Bear with me. We don't have all faith. Nobody does. For I say through the grace given unto me that to every man that is among you, every man that is among you, that, that's all of us, folks, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, According as God hath dealt to every man a single measure of faith, it's singular in the Greek, a single measure of faith. I have been given a measure of faith. You've been given a measure of faith. That measure may or may not be the same. I, I seriously doubt it's the same with any one of us. We're all on different levels, different spiritual growth levels. Okay? The measure of faith that a baby in Christ has is far different than the measure of faith that a, an aged old saint, say, you know, who's a 90 years old, has. I mean, that's just common sense. The more we walk and grow in grace and knowledge of Christ, the more faith that God invests in our lives. It's partly because of the time factor. But it also has a lot to do with how much we have to do with, with that book that he's given us to study. So we don't have all faith. And we're to think soberly. Okay? This, this, is, this is something that, that it really, it's, it's almost, God is almost saying to you, you, and, you and I, this is common sense, folks. Okay? that we're gonna, we're, we are going to, to think more highly than we ought to think of ourselves if we don't understand that we've all been given a singular measure of faith. That's not the measure, but a measure. So now for the firecracker here, okay? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14, 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and whatever Whatever, the word is everything, that is not from, out of, in the Greek, ek, out of faith, is sin. <clears throat> I almost am at a loss of words here, folks, uh, at this point, because ver what this verse is telling you and I is that we can be staring at the wall, doubting, and be sinning. That's right. You can sit on your couch, arms folded, doing nothing, and be sinning. I want you to let that sink in for a moment. Now, these aren't my words. These are God's words. Whatever is not of faith is sin. It's just the opposite of faith exercised equals true righteousness. Whatever is not of faith is sin. The plowing of the wicked is sin. We know that from the Old Testament. 
Therefore, since we have not all faith, we need a remedy. We need a remedy for uninterrupted fellowship with God because, you know, since, since that's true, being that that is true, that whatever is not of faith is, is sin, we're going to be sinning constantly as we walk in the light of, of the truth that God's given us. We see that in 1 John. Are you with me so far? We need a remedy for uninterrupted fellowship with God, and blessedly, folks, he's provided us one. So now we come to the bombshell here. And I've, I've talked quite a bit about this since I began this, this ministry. And that is the reckoning, uh, God's provision for ongoing sin, reckoning, Romans 6, 11. Likewise, reckon, count it as true, ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Dead unto sin. That sin that is not of faith, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, dead, alive. You got to look at both parts of, of Romans 6, 11. Dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now we have to face the, the indisputable fact that we have two natures, not just one. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Why? Because his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. That's the new man, man the new man, the sinless new man. All the old man does is sin. Crucified with Christ, folks, yet raised with Christ to walk in newness of life, his life. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. That's his life. So now, we now come into the beauty of it all. Okay, this is the beauty of it all. This takes us to a subject which is very dear and near and dear to my heart. Christ manifests in and through our lives by faith. It's not about self. It's not about law. It's not about the flesh. It's not about human performance or human merit. As is widely taught, even our expression of the Christian life is directly related to Someone. It's not to pick it up, read it, just do it. Well, that's, that, you know, and that always seemed too simple of a, a formula, you know, if you want to put it, in, couch it in those terms. A method, a formula, to me, it always seemed just too easy. I mean, if that's all, and then later on in my Christian life, I had a conflict with, well, there, now the law came in, so that, that picking it up, reading it, and just doing it, mindset just didn't jive with the fact that we were not under law, that we died to the law, that we might bear fruit unto God. So it's Christ manifest in and through our lives by faith, the very faith that we've been talking about. It's not about self. It's not about us. It's not about human performance. He's, Christ is not far off in some shadowy corner of our existence, folks. He doesn't just sit in the, in the, in the forefront or, or, in many cases, the back end of our minds. First of all, he's a person. Second of all, he's alive. Third of all, he's present. He lives and works in you. He lives and works in and through your life, and he does that by faith. We live and walk by faith. That, that is the Christian life, folks. We, we've, I know Christians love to talk a lot about faith, but they don't really look at the, at the real dynamic of it and just how vital, vitally important that that subject is as it regards our walk in Christ. Faith, folks, is where, where, where it's all at. It's all about faith. It's all about believing God. 
because that is what he desires the most of us, that we trust in him. Read Romans 6, 11 again. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. As it regards Christ manifest, here's one verse that actually speaks to this directly. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, death, that's death to self, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Christ manifest, folks. You really must let the reality of that grand truth sink deep into the private sanctuary of your soul. It's, 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 a, it's almost, I feel like I'm, t I'm walking on sacred ground when I even talk about Christ manifest. The, the idea that he actually lives his life in and through us and, and that when we confront others, we confront one another and they don't see us, they see Christ. Why? Because he's manifest himself in and through our lives and he's done so by faith. It's not about law keeping. It's not about fleshly performance. It's about trusting God. 2 Corinthians 4.10 reminds us we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Beautiful, beautiful verse. 2 Corinthians 4.12 So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. 2 Corinthians 6, 9, as unknown yet well known, dying, and yet we live, punished yet not killed. There are other verses, you know, if, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. It is all about Christ, folks. It's not about the old man, the flesh, which was crucified with Christ. It is, in all reality, an exchanged life, ours for his. Is that not how it began? Is that not how it began? You came to Christ. You laid it all on the altar. You said, here I am, Lord. I have nothing to offer you. You're, you're my all. You're everything I need. I'll, I exchanged my life for yours. And then we go away and we, well, we forgot all about that. It's how we began. It, it is what allowed us to stand. And it is how we walk and run. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin. That is the sin singular. That's the old man that so easily entangles us, and boy, does it. And let us run with endurance the race set out before us. Let us fix our eyes on who? Ourselves? No. Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I mean, it's little wonder that we now come to the matter of rest. We've come from studying to show ourselves approved to the point to where that we actually rest in faith, the faith that he's given us, counting ourselves to be dead indeed under the sin which springs forth from that old nature that was crucified with Christ. Spiritual rest, the rest, the rest of faith, Hebrews, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore, what, to produce out of the flesh? No. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Psalms 104 tells us, These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. We are looking at the rest of faith, folks, which we can see even in the Old Testament. And I suggest you spend some time in Hebrews chapter 11. It's a marvelous chapter regarding the importance of faith. The outworking of all of this now takes up the matter of life, service, and worship. 
As it regards service, we read in Philippians chapter 2, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. And there are many more verses on service. In fact, there's too many to mention. As it regards worship, in John and, and in Philippians, we, we know from, from passages there, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Finally, my brethren, writes Paul, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me. Indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So the result of all of this is liberty liberty not to just live however you want that's not christian liberty but liberty as paul described it seeing then that we have such hope we use great plainness of speech and not as moses which put a veil over his face that the children of israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished but their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I hope this has helped. I hope that you found this to be as much a blessing in your life as I have mine. I want you to know that I truly love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.